All right, I'm going to start. <laughs> so um, I appreciate you coming back uh, for this um, for another session. It's a it's a long day, um, and I'm sure when you were standing up there, uh, you were looking out the window and thinking that maybe better things to do than to go back into the basement. <laughs> but uh, thanks for coming back and. Um, um, so, uh, um, uh, Sid has provoked us to think about accountability, and um, um, and this. So, what I'm talking about today is is uh, is uh, is around a, a short text that I have written for for uh, for a book that that uh, Sid is developing, um, and uh, I'm. I, th I thought it was a, it's a really good opportunity to think about. A, an issue that I have um, not done in a lot of in-depth um, empirical research on myself um, this far, but that we have touched on in a lot of different research projects uh, on, on cities and urban governance and, and climate transformation. And that is the question of, do climate targets matter? So we set, we set these targets and they're becoming more and more ambitious, um, and uh, national states are setting targets, cities are setting, are setting targets, companies are setting targets. And does it really matter? How are these targets actually influencing what we actually do? So that's sort of the broad question that I, I, I want to, to talk about. And I'll talk about a specific target a little bit later. Um, but I hope that this, we can spend this hour on basically talking around this question of, of, of how these climate targets actually influence uh, policy and how, who's, who's accountable to them, what sort of accountability uh, relations do we see um, around these, um, the, the, these targets. And I think looking at uh, climate policy internationally at sort of a bird's eye perspective, uh, we're talking a lot about these targets. And in a way, it seems like that's what, what climate policy is. It's setting these abstract goals uh, into the future. Um, and a lot of, sort of progressive policy, uh, political push has been to try to get policymakers to, to, to set this, these goals and to set them as ambitiously as, as, uh, as possible, with the assumption that if we get ambitious goals, um, then, uh, then, then good things will happen. But at the same time, if you look at some of these goals, um, they're really ambitious and perhaps unrealistic. And it makes you wonder, do they really, do they really matter? Or, um, yeah, so do they matter and how do they matter? What is the role for, for transformation uh, of these targets? Why don't we just go, about, uh, go out and do something? Why do we need to talk so much about uh, th this, um, this targeting? And, so I, I've come into this, this issue in, in a lot of different w ways, um, but one, re one recent example I had thinking about this, we, um, we, uh, I was part of organizing a debate with local politicians and I was moderating, moderating the debate. And we asked this question to the politicians in Bergen. Um, will, so Bergen has the goal of being fossil free by 2030. So fossil free by 2030. And so we asked this go. Uh, we asked them several questions where they had to answer yes or no. Um, and one of the questions was, "Will Bergen uh, reach the target of becoming fossil free by 2030?" And so here's what they said: the green card is is uh, is yes, uh, and the red card is is no. So basically, all the parties, uh, the politicians from all parties, said yes, Bergen will reach this goal. The exceptions uh, are the Communist Party and the Progress Right Wing Party. So, sort of the fringe fringe parties, they were the skeptical, saying, "Well, we don't. We the communist party, red party, red. So it's not communist now. After this general assembly they had this weekend, I understand. Um, uh, but um, they say, well, we would like to reach the goal. We don't think it will happen because of the capitalist model. Uh, right-wing populists, of course, they object to the whole um, idea, partly, partly not. 
But all the other sort of mainstream parties were, were uh, said, yes, we'll reach the tar this target. Also, another thing in, in Norwegian news um, uh, recently, Norway's oil city. So Stavanger is Norway's um, oil city where, where the most of the oil industry is, is located. Uh, the whole city and its industry is predicated on, on the oil industry. Recently decided we're going to cut CO2 emissions by 80%. Uh, by within 2030. And then the question was, uh, came later in the, the sort of the public debate, so how are we going to reach that goal? And it became quite clear that they don't really know how to reach, how to reach that target, but it's more of sort of the practice of, of, of setting the goal. So I, I think this is, a, this is a good way, this, this target sen setting within climate policy is a good way to think about, think about accountability and to think about um, understanding transition and transformation uh, if, uh, in a way that speaks to, to, to the, sort of the, the framework and concepts uh, that, that Sid has, has, uh, has put forward for, for this workshop. So we might say that, that these targets uh, or rather the gap between these targets and what's actually happening on the ground constitutes a crisis of accountability. So who is accountable? No one or, or, uh, it seems like, it could be, we might say that um, it's difficult to see that anyone's accountable for reaching these goals in a substantive way. Politicians are elected for a short, uh, for typically for four years. Um, and by 2030, I guess they're all thinking we'll be out of office by then. Um, uh, so, so it's someone else's, someone else's problems, someone else's problem. And also, um, we, I think this is a good entry point to think about practices of legitimation, uh, because we might ask the question of what, what kind of practices do, does this target setting uh, legitimize? And if you look at, at um, a lot of, lot of the, the critical social science literature uh, on, uh, on, uh, uh, around these, this sort of target setting and, and, um, and climate, climate policy, a lot of it is, um, would take what I would say is a very, very skeptical view uh, of this target setting and would call and would label it what I would, what I would um, categorize as, as, uh, as rhetorical political practice. So target setting is about uh, they ma the targets matter for the way they work as a as a rhetoric within the political debate. So um, politicians, political agents, are sort of competing um, to become to to propose more ambitious targets in order to seem um, to take this, the the climate challenge uh, seriously. While not dealing with this underlying structural uh, energy system condition. And uh, Swingdow in 2010 published a paper where I think he describes this perspective quite, quite accurately, um, where he talks about the climate, um, sort of the push to do something about climate change, the CO2 reduction uh, efforts, as being sort of inserted into this vast uh, techno-managerial apparatus, um, and it's very sort of complex um, uh, institutional landscape uh, and configurations that that seem very advanced, but actually serves the purpose of making sure that nothing really changes. So we've, we've seen all this this sort of policy of of uh, of um, um, uh, proposing sort of parts of the status quo as, as part of the solution. And in Norway, we see, of course, there's a lot of, of focus on, on natural gas um, uh, as part of the solution to energy transitions. Uh, as nor uh, with this, this rhetoric that, that natural gas, fossil fuel, of course, uh, is a bridge to, uh, to uh, sort of the post-carbon uh, post -carbon society. Uh, or uh, Equinur, Statoil, uh, making these scenarios for how to reach the two degree target. Uh, and all of this, the scenarios happen to include uh, oil and gas way into the future. Um, <coughs> and looking at the city level, which is my, my 
primary interest. Um, there was a study uh, by, by Josefine Wangel and, and, and co-authors, a uh, person that we collaborate with, looking at, at how these targets are made uh, in, in, in cities. And what they, they conclude is that cities, they uh, define a lot of different targets, but what the methodologies are, how they will be calculated, uh, what they actually mean, uh, what's included and what's not included, uh, is, is, is very unclear in the way the targets are formulated. And uh, the city administrators, those who are accountable, should be accountable to these targets, uh, are not really aware of the issue, of, uh, of how, how weakly defined they are and how unclear what the, the, what the targets are. Um, I have a PhD student, Stina Usulon. She's also uh, studying these sort of climate pro planning processes uh, in, in various cities in Norway, and it's also so focused on, on, on sort of the process of, of how these targets uh, have been uh, decided upon. Uh, and and, um, uh, and um, the sort of the limited process of, of, uh, of, of climate planning. So goals, basically her argument is that goals are typically, um, uh, typically uh, decided upon without assessing sort of the, 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 the realism of it or what it would take to, to reach them. So that's fine. Um, but I think that, that's, that's one part of the, the, the picture. And I think that this is, as, as for me, as critical social scientists uh, and a lot of other people in our community, I think this skeptical view uh, of target setting is... Um, so maybe our, our kind of our, our um, uh, initial, what do you call it, then sort of our knee-jerk knee -jerk reaction in a way. It's, it's, t it's tempting to think of targets in this way. But within uh, in this text that I um, have uh, written for, drafted for this book, um, I wonder, is there another side to this? I, sort of accepting all this pro all these problems and limitations of climate targets, can we also think of the other side of the coin? that these targets actually, in some way, um, uh, influence policy, maybe not by sort of spurring politicians and, and decision makers to action immediately, but by working them, the, their way into uh, pol uh, policy discourses, uh, bureaucratic processes, um, and all kinds of, of different, uh, different practices. Maybe that's uh, another side uh, of the coin. And I think uh, climate policy is, um, is, is a good, um, uh, is an instance where these sort of abstract goals may have an effect. Because climate is a, an area of environmental governance where, we, where it's relatively easy to, to quantify things. We talk about the two degree target. We talk about parts per million in the atmosphere. We talk about uh, reduction, per percentage reduction in CO2 emissions. I mean, sustainable development is much more complex and much more difficult to quantify, much more difficult to, say, to set specific targets for. And there have been scholars that um, um, have argued that, that climate can actually be politicized in, in a different way because it's... Um, it's, uh, it's uh, sort of susceptible to, to quantification and to metrics. Think about the two degree targets, for example, which in itself is a relatively arbitrary limit. Uh, and think about how that target has sort of traveled through discourses, tr traveled through uh, institutional documents, uh, traveled into decisions uh, and whether or not it has shaped actual practice, uh, it's hard to say, but it's a very big part of, of, uh, of many discussions. So perhaps we can think of these targets as, as, as influencing actual policy through a, a range of different mechanisms. Of uh, a range of different ways where they influence and push and nudge um, decisions and processes in particular directions. Yeah. Seduction, normalization, mainstreaming, and legitimization. 
Because I think, um, and here is where I maybe I, I push the, the, the framework a little bit. Um, Or maybe I'm, I'm not. You, you tell me. But uh, so, so Sid put forward this this typology of, of practices of, of, of legitimation: uh, discursive, bureaucratic, technocratic, uh, and financial. And maybe these are ways that targets also work to legitimize uh, climate action in certain ways. At least it's worth considering. And. Um, I think there's one example that I know of, uh, of a target that has been successful. And I'm going to talk about that now. And that's what I would, uh, in English, call the zero growth objective in Norwegian transport policy. Nullvext Morla. And, for, and this is, uh, so I follow this, this, uh, this, this sector, both in research and public debate. And you hear about this target all the time. Nullvextmåla, nullvextmåla, nullvextmåla. What it means, uh, or what it says, is that this formulation here, uh, in Norwegian, of course, all growth in personal uh, traffic in the largest cities, I, should, I think it should be car traffic, will be covered by public transport, walking, and cycling. So basically, the projection was, or has been, that cities uh, will grow. Uh, traffic in urban areas uh, will subsequently grow. All that growth, none of that growth will be taken by personal cars. All that growth will be taken by public transportation, cycling, uh, and walking. So that's why, where the zero growth comes from. Zero growth in car traffic in, urban, in large urban areas uh, in Norway. So that's zero growth. And this, uh, the, these terms, public transport, um, uh, walking and cycling. Collective gange or cycle. Collective gange or cycle. Collective gange or cycle. See that that phrase. We we'll just say, say KGS now because that phrase comes up everywhere. And so, um, <coughs> so I've been interested in this and, how, and and thinking about how has this target just I mean maybe just the words uh, influenced the uh, practices. And, and uh, actual, uh, actual policy, actual sort of substantive change. So I've tried to trace back this, uh, this objective and how it's been formulated over time. So it goes back to 2006. Uh, this is the first time, at least I have found it, in a Norwegian po policy document where this public transport, cycling and walking is kind of mentioned, oh, that would be nice. We, it would be nice with some more public uh, transport, walking and cycling. In a very sort of all parties uh, in parliament, except for the right-wing progress party, agreed on a single sort of, uh, a set of climate policies. And here, uh, public transport, walking and cycling uh, was also mentioned as a goal. A bit more precisely, or a bit more strongly worded. And then... <coughs> They started um, with the uh, Belønningsavtale, 2009. And this was a, a, a measure where um, uh, cities were rewarded with funding. Uh, we got a little bit of extra funding if they managed to, to sort of have good measures in place to deal with uh, various sustainability issues. So this was the first time they started tying funding at least the way I've traced this back. It's the first time they started tying funding back to something related to how cities were doing in terms of sustainability. And then, in the uh, National Transport Plan, so National Transport Plan is a huge thing in Norway. That's where all the uh, infrastructure investments are, are decided. The secretariat uh, in Oslo who made this plan, they uh, proposed that we should make uh, public the, the zero growth in public uh, transport, walking and cycling as a specific goal. And they even coined the phrase nullvextmåla, zero growth objective. And I've seen uh, in an interview later, uh, they, they've said, we wanted to find a target that was easy to measure, that would be ambitious, and at least, at not, not least, and not least reachable. 
easy to measure, ambitious, and reachable. So that then worked its way into the white paper, same year, where it's specified very concretely. Zero growth is the target. National Transport Plan, it's all over the National Transport Plan 2014, mentioned 23 times. And from 2016, the, we have these um, urban, uh, the BVEX-Taftale, the urban growth packages. These are the agreements between the state and the major cities of Norway that decide how much money uh, the state will invest in infrastructure in the major cities of Norway. Here, the zero growth target is what determines whether or not the cities will get money. So, from just being mentioned as something nice, 2006, we can see this progressive um, uh, preciseness becoming more and more sort of precisely formulated. It gets a name, Nullvex Morla, zero growth objective. It's tied to funding. Uh, and the National Transport Plan from last year mentioned it 51 times. And now uh, they are vastly expanding this program here, urban uh, environment packages to, to, to more cities and to include uh, municipalities around cities. So right now, Nullvex Morla is an incredibly important indicator for, for, uh, for how money flows to cities in Norway, meaning that cities have to deliver on this, uh, on, this, uh, on this target. So over time, we see then that it's becoming progressively more uh, precisely phrased, uh, even with a name. It's tied to funding, and it's metricized, I would say. So you have to, it has to be measured. And that now we're talking about, we've been talking about for a while, how to measure it, um, how, um, uh, what, what are the boundaries, um, if the state of the, sort of the, the, the national authorities build a gigantic road going into a city that will increase the traffic, will that affect the funding that the city gets for not, not reaching the target? I mean, basically, it's the state that provides all these extra cars. So these sorts of discussions are going on now, sort of really on how, how to measure this uh, and how, to, uh, how this, um, these, uh, these uh, funding streams should be tied to what cities are actually doing in this, in this area. And here's the, uh, from uh, 2017, the Bergen's agreement with the state. It's funding uh, the Bergen light rail, among other things. Uh, and if you look at, so this is the front page of this agreement between uh, Bergen region and the state. First sentence of the agreement. The government has as a goal the growth in personal transport, blah, 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 collective, cycle, or gange. Public transport, cycling, and walking. So first sentence, KGS. So this target has uh, really sort of worked its way through, I would say, uh, the governance system. And, and for me, it's an incredibly interesting case study of how that has, ha has happened. Uh, and I'd like to, to, uh, to, to study this further, but this is sort of where, where I am at now. I, sort of, uh, I have contextual knowledge about the sector, and I've traced these policy documents. Um, and just as sort of as a side note, uh, we're, we're seeing, as with the yellow vests and, and, and all this uh, whole sort of movement gripping Europe at the moment, uh, we have a local variation of this in, in, in Norway with uh, this um, anti-toll road movement, enough is enough. And uh, they have a local party running for election this fall, and they are polling at 20%. Third largest party. So it's a huge opposition. And that's, I think, partly because these uh, policies are now becoming so concrete, right? So, so cities can't just, within this area, cities can't just say, oh, yeah, we want to be green and we want to be fossil free in 2030. They're doing something, you know, and, and uh, they have to, have to, because otherwise it would impact the funding streams. And, and in this whole debate, the, even the, this target is not even, uh, the, tar the target is well known. So it, it, it's not sort of a, a bureaucratic secret uh, hidden in some document that no one reads. Nullvex Morla has become well known in public debate. It's used by 
supporters and opposition, and opposition uh, alike. So, all right. So that was the story of um, of um, uh, model. Let me uh, see how much time do I have? How, what time is it? Twenty-five minutes left. Okay. So, so back to the. Um, to the uh, original question, I'll try to sort of wrap up and, and, and move away from this particular uh, per particular case. And and I, th I think, um, I mean, we would like uh, targets to, you know, when politicians um, set targets, they at the same time have a clear pathway of how, how to get there and they're following that pathway. That's not happening. But I do think, uh, that, that targets have a certain way, some more than others, um, of working their way into the discussion. I could do a similar study on, on the two degree target, and it would be harder to, to sort of trace that to specific actions, I think. Um, but there we also see how it's, uh, it, it's sort of, it, it's, it's being mainstreamed into documents, mainstreamed into the, to, to, to the discussion. And, and more and more sort of accepted for for what it is. So I think with the two degree target, it's been it's moved from saying, oh yeah, maybe climate change is happening, uh, we don't really know yet. Until so uh, two, degree, two degree target would be nice, but yeah. So now, uh, at least in sort of our part of the world, uh, I recognize the United States might be different, uh, and some other places in the world, but. Um, where, where, where most hegemonic players uh, are accepting the two degree target, we're just debating sort of the, the, the how to get there and are, are we doing enough, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, that has also solidified, uh, solidified in a way. And I think it, I was thinking about this sort of what, so what, what processes are at work, what practices of legitimation are at work that, 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 uh, that, 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 that causes this. And I, I kind of have, thinking back on Sid's topology, I, I have a hard time kind of separating, separating them uh, in, in a way. Because I think, at least looking at sort of the case study that I just talked about, um, discursive, bureaucratic, technocratic, financial legitimation are sort of wrapped, wrapped into one. Um, perhaps there are cases where these the first three of them are wrapped into one, but the financial is not there. And then I would ex expect maybe the the, the effects to be a lot less. I think uh, a key part, of course, and like to stop building the light rail, but the light rail um, through this agreement with the state, uh, we're getting six billion. We have to do something about climate change. Um, its main legitimation i think comes through the argument that we need attractive cities we need um uh, we need to deal with the growing traffic problems uh it's uh it's it's point uh, sort of the cities city centers are now i think, I think filled with younger people who have, who have this this idea that 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 urban centers should be sort of vi filled with life and, and and lively and attractive um, and, and less concerned about driving and parking. So, so it's sort of um, it's appealing not just to sort of parts per million of uh, carbon in the atmosphere. It's appealing to across a range of different uh, a range of different causes. And I think that's 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 a really uh, critical uh, crit critical part of it. So, yeah. So, I I. I um, I would share this, this, this frustration and the skepticism of, of this target setting practice uh, with a lot of the theorists who have written about this. But I, th I do think that we also need to look at the other side of the coin uh, and look at how, um, at least in a gradual perspective, um, targets do have a way of, of, of um, working their way into, uh, into discourse. We are looking at climate change and climate change policy in a different way now than we did five years ago and 10 years ago. And that's, that's promising. Thanks. Thanks, Howard.
floor is open, so please step up. Thank you so much. It was very interesting. Um, Liz Chatterjee actually just presented on this at AAG yeah. last month. Um, and she's looking at the way that the Prime Minister of India, Modi, uses climate targets as a way to galvanize change, but also to see who he has political support, uh, support from at the state level. And her argument is really that he has no scientific background, mm -hmm. scientific advisors give him advice, and then he throws it out the window and he picks whatever number he yeah. likes. And they're always these beautifully round figures. And I just thought it was really an interesting way to kind of look at his political strength, but also to see if that kind of tool that he's using as a political mechanism, if ultimately that's going to lead to actual practical change on the ground. So I was curious in Norway, I don't know as much about your federal and decentralized structure here, but do you see kind of a similar rhetoric being picked up locally as a political tool um, to kind of reflect back on the national government, or is that really kind of India-specific that we're seeing that trend happen? Well, I, 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 you can definitely see how, how it's, um, uh, it, it's used uh, politically. I mean, one mechanism that I, that I, that I thought of when you were, you were talking is not per, uh, perhaps exactly the same, but, but um, uh, sort of in the same realm. I See this, how I mean, politicians are, 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 are deciding on these targets and say, yes, we're going to do this. And maybe they don't really know what, they're, what, what that implies, don't even think about what that implies. But then we're seeing other actors are sort of taking that goal and say, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you, we, uh, you decided this last year. Um, how are you going to, to meet this? Or... Um, if you now go forward this particular policy uh, of building another road, how are we going to meet this other goal uh, of, let's say, zero growth objective? Um, so, so I think you're absolutely right that, that these targets are being used politically. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of hard to, to, to avoid in a way. And maybe we don't, we don't even want to avoid it. I think, I th I think it's, it's a huge win that they become part of the debate in a way uh, that doesn't solve the problem by itself but i think uh, i think the, the 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 worst thing that can happen is there's it's just they're 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 um, they're, they're decided upon it's a beautiful round figure fantastic um and then uh, we sort of we feel yeah we're doing something we have this ambitious target and then forget about it and then i think it's more mobilizing that it's actually part of the uh, political debate, um, even though some political actors will definitely use it for causes that are not necessarily um, really about pushing sustainability. Uh, I like that, I think, to, to say that it's the good news if it gets politicized, it's mm. the good news. Mm. So it's funny, I was also going to introduce Liz's work, and Siddharth would know this from the Toronto meeting. She gave a paper on soft targets. Mm -hmm. And um, it really made a big impression on me, so the same reference. Um, I would uh, ask or encourage you to think about uh, uh, de, um, disaggregating across targets. Because as you put, I had made a note, I mean, you know, uh, children asthma, public health, congestion, road safety, aesthetics, real estate values, freeing up land for other purposes. The list goes on and on about the win, 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 win mm -hmm. if you get the cars out of the center yeah. city. Yeah. So I think it's uh, an easy case. Yeah. Um, and I think if you apply your uh, optimistic, and I always appreciate your optimism, mm -hmm. but if you apply it to something um, that's gonna cut more deep and there's not gonna be a lot of win-win, it's gonna be lose, 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 but yeah. ecology wins, yeah. uh, future generations win, you will not find the same result. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, in, in a sense, sort of urban sustainability is, is sort of a thankful task in, in this sense because it, it has these win-win situations. At least, at least we, we think they do. Um, and, but we have to a certain extent been challenged on, uh, about that. Um, because I mean, I, I've talked about urban sustainability in, in, in a sense of saying, well, this is you know, such a 
popular and powerful discourse now and cities all over Europe are, are turning their urban spaces into <coughs> pedestrian and pedestrian spaces uh, away from cars, etc., etc. So this is like, this is the way we're going. Um, with these, yeah, so it's sort of a purely win-win. But I, I think we've really been challenged on this uh, the, past, the past couple of years with this, especially the last few months, um, with this very strong movement of people who, who, who oppose that kind of, of, of shift in cities. Uh, and and uh, go back to this rhetoric that we thought was sort of outdated of the car, you know, being sort of a, uh, almost like a human right um, and, and, and sort of part of, 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 nor of normal everyday people's uh, necessary livelihood. Which was is called uh, caused a lot of soul searching f for me, I think, because we, we really sort of assumed that that sort of things were shifting in a different direction. Um, but I mean, besides that, I, I absolutely agree with your point. I think uh, this is a case of um, yeah, where, where we, we have these win-win-win uh, situations, and yeah, things might look different if you look at other types of cases. Uh, thanks very much for this talk. It was great. And uh, actually, my question picks up on this, so I'm glad that you returned to this, which is really a provocative end to the talk. And I think I would love to hear how, how this movement challenges the notion, the normative notion of accountability. Because these people are demanding accountability too. But they're demanding it in a way that would not align with the general sentiments in this room, right? But it's not, it's no less accountability. Yeah. And maybe that, maybe this is so familiar to me because I, I'm coming from the US. And the public in the US wants accountability too, but they want it, you know, in favor of kind of denying climate change and, right, denying that yeah. there is anything like human, yeah. human impacted yeah. climate change at all. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I think it's 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 critical, and again, the 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 soul, the soul searching. I mean, uh, in the Norwegian by us, they have our ideas, and <laughs> yeah, that's where our, our master students get their get, get jobs. It's uh, you know doing this kind of thing, which uh, so we've kind of yeah, that's maybe our main impact uh, as uh, scholars, um, and uh, yeah, I we uh, they um, I meet them uh, in the city center, and they have electric bikes like I do, and uh, we agree on everything. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was I thought that was they yeah, they're very accountable to me. <laughs> but uh, so and, and we thought that was great. Uh, but then this happened, right? So we thought maybe so maybe they're not accountable to to a lot of other people. Uh, and maybe I'm not accountable. Maybe I mean I'm a public sector. Uh, you know, the Norwegian universities are paid 100% by uh, public with public money, and um, uh, you know maybe I should also be accountable to other people than those who <laughs> prefer that kind of urban um, uh, lifestyle. So uh, so yeah, it's a really critical issue, and uh, and I think um, uh, we've we've also done. Studies. Um, we have master students um, uh, looking at who, who who's uh, using the car the carpooling ring, who's using the city bikes, and it's sort of all, more than ninety percent of them have uh, higher education. Ni more than ninety percent. It's, it's just the tiny sliver of the. Well, most people in Norway, a lot of people in Norway are highly educated, but still, it's 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 a, it's a subset of the population. So, and that's kind of what. What this uh, kind of protest and that whole rhetoric around uh, enough is enough, stop this, this, this kind of compact city urban uh, policy agenda uh, is about. It really ties in with the, with the yellow vest and even right-wing populism. Because it's, if you look at the Facebook page, pages, so they have many Facebook pages with thousands and thousands of members. and, and they are, I mean, it's sort of a, this sort of anti-elitist uh, discourse is very, very strong. Uh, there is Enough is Enough Bergen group. They regularly post uh, YouTube videos of yellow vest protests in France. So they're very interconnected, and there's uh, in, into this broader movement uh, in Europe that are saying, 
you know, the elites, elites don't represent us. Uh, ordinary people are not being heard. So in their depiction of things, uh, you know, urban uh, city planners, uh, many uh, city, city uh, local politicians, academics, uh, are part of one group of people who have, are the elite and who have sort of agree on a lot of things uh, and don't represent the views. So, and this is familiar, Brexit and Trump and all, all, all the rest of it. But I mean, uh, yeah, I, there, there, part of it, there's something to it. And that's, that's the scary bit. And yeah, so maybe we need to think about our own account accountability. I think it's really interesting, this, this um, Norwegian yellow vests. Um, I think if, if you're a, if we can be a little bit ceremonial, if you're a professor at the University of Bergen, maybe you're accountable to truth, even if it's inconvenient. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if we just, let's park climate change on the side, right? Then this whole zero growth of cars in towns, to me, looks like a conjuring trick by the wealthy to increase their real estate value by letting poor people pay a higher price on public transport, right? So, you know, maybe there's a higher purpose. Uh, maybe we've got a lot of UN reports saying that the whole thing is going to hell. But um, if you li live in the fifth arrondissement in Paris or in the center of Bergen or Oslo, you can at least you can go to hell on first class because your whole value is being subsidized by people who are basically going to pay bumping and everything else, right? Mm. So maybe when we talk about accountability in, in, in this sense, um, uh, we need to disaggregate it quite a bit. Yeah. Um, because basically, this is um, this is uh, how, should, how should I say it's uh, um, it's class formation in comfort, right? You're basically you get your nice little electric bike, you can you can scoot around in the in the in the inner city, and it's aesthetic, it's wealth, uh, and and um, you you can um, you can do it with a clear conscience, whereas. Those ill-educated people who are noisy and don't feel that they're ever being heard, they just misunderstood the whole plot, right? But in some sense, they understood the plot perfectly. Money's being lifted out of their pockets to subsidize your real estate uh, in the name of uh, mitigation of climate change. It's, I mean, I would understand why, why people put on a yellow vest. And I think if we, if we want to use accountability for something, maybe we should disaggregate it and figure out who is accountable to them. Yeah, uh, but if you want to, uh, I mean, if you want to talk about truth, you can also say uh, science shows that uh, climate change is happening. It's man-made. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But uh, Bergen reduced its CO2 emissions by 10% last year, uh, and they uh, most. I mean, we contributed that to uh, a decrease in traffic. So you, you could sort of return to. This, well, if you want to return to truth, I think you could, you could look at it as a, a climate solution. Uh, and that, that, yeah, you could say that, well, that's just a class argument, but it, it, it's, it's still there. And, and, uh, and, and then you could, could, could at least find uh, grounds for some of these policies, hold them accountable uh, through truth. But I do think there is a whole sort of discourse around this compact city urbanization or you know, urban sustainability thing where we have kind of yeah, accepted some parts that are not necessarily uh, grounded in that sort of truth, uh, yeah, truth grounded in you know, coming back to, to, to climate change and what we need to do to cut emissions. So uh, a great deal is, be, is talked about uh, urban sustainability, but um, perhaps an ignorant question. What about, uh, is there such a thing as rural sustainability uh, or, uh, yeah, countryside sustainability? Because if we're talking about yellow vests and the cost of 
cars and public transportation, etc., a direct cause basically for uh, the emergence of the of the of the movement in France was this basic idea that if you live in the French countryside, you just need a car. There's no such thing as public transportation in France, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the in the countryside. Yep. Um, so yeah, how how would that fit with 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 the discussion that we're having uh, here today and this this contestation between uh, urban elites and countryside uh, neglected uh, or, 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 or groups of uh, social groups that feel neglected. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. Right. I think I, I saw several hands. I'll collect some questions and uh, bring in as much. Uh, my question is related to scale, uh, and that's one dimension you, you uh, did not bring into the discussion, that uh, you're having national targets. Uh, and then you see uh, a very strong movement uh, among cities uh, overfulfilling the targets and promising uh, even more reductions uh, than uh, the national governments, where national governments, they are sort of tied up to national compromises and promises to the fossil industry and the car industry and what have you. Mm. Uh, whereas uh, cities, they at least appear to have some strategic uh, uh, goals of becoming something different, to become more attractive, yes, uh, maybe to, to uh, those who already live there and who have real estate, as Christian says. Uh, but still, uh, it, is in, uh, it is instigating uh, national or, or international competition uh, between the cities to become greener and so on. Uh, so in effect, you may up, end up with situations actually where the cities are the actors more than the states are. Uh, so isn't that beautiful? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have just a short uh, answer to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to know what time it is, just so I can sort of let's see. OK, two minutes left then. Um, I raised my hand when you said it's uh, a question of truth. Isn't it a matter of truth? Why? Why is it not a matter of policy instruments and how they are designed? Oh. I mean, in Germany, we're now having a huge debate on CO2 uh, taxing. And there are different how much energy. It's pretty clear that those people, and they might not be the, the most disadvantaged because the most disadvantaged... I'll sneak, sneak in a question if uh, there aren't others. One, one thing that I think is worth bringing in here is, uh, is telecoupling, so material flows that are translocal. And uh, we're in a city which is a regional transport hub for aviation, so Bergen Airport, which used to have a capacity of two and a half million passenger flights uh, or passengers uh, a year, but was running into six million a year just expanded a year and a half ago and opened a new terminal, so now we can do seven and a half million passengers a year. Though we have a light rail to the airport, so... <laughs> so, not so it to... Kind of, it kind of evens out. <laughs> so not to belabor the point, but, uh, but geography shows us that people who live in cities with better access to airports fly more, and, mm -hmm. and so all of this could one say is a performance, as, uh, as Blue Dorn would say, of, of sustainability without the mm -hmm. substance of it, and... Mm -hmm. And are we distracting again from issues of sustainability in transport for urban residents versus sustainability within this very localized environment rather than in the practices of those who actually live there? Mm. But I get that it's a different set of actors and authorities. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I, I, I think all the questions, uh, or I see them as four, four comments uh, here, uh, or sort of pushes to, to me to, to take this, for, this, this, this on. Um, uh, we're in different ways about sort of inclusive, thinking inclusively, I think, about uh, policy design and, and, and the politics of sustainability. Well, rural, including the rural aspects, um, thinking internationally, um, 
of, of policy design and how to make policy design uh, and think through policy design and to, to include more actors in, in this, this, this um, uh, process of policy change. And also with Sid, uh, of, of sort of is, is this sort of urban policy for looking at the city centers, etc., uh, representative of substantive change. So, um, um, so, so I think, um, so I think uh, I, I don't really have good. Uh, I'm not going to go into a good answer for each each of them. I don't think I necessarily have that. But, but um, I, I do think that we're, uh, yeah, we we have been pushed to think more inclusively about uh, urban sustainability t t t policies. Um, a lot of these, these sort of counter arguments are uh, bringing up the sort of rural, rural aspects. Okay, we, 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 we use a lot of public resources on building public um, transport infrastructure. Who is that for? Uh, it's for the city center, but what about the, 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 the suburban uh, areas that, that where, where people also have to pay uh, for these types of, um, of, um, uh, of policies? Um, without necessarily getting the the, the, the benefits. So the, what sort of we, uh, I, I'm also part of the, the public debate on this uh, in, in Bergen, and so what we have been arguing is that, well, if you drive in the Bergen region, you are using the light rail. Uh, or uh, you should be in agreement with these sorts of, this policy shift because of climate change. Um, and I think that, yeah, I, I, I do think that those arguments don't really necessarily work anymore. Uh, and we have to think of more inclusive ways to, 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 to design sustainability policies uh, around cities. And yeah, I think this has shown a really um, impressive development of one particular goal. But it's, it's also been been, been been challenged very very strongly. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how to how to end this this uh, this uh, rambling. <laughs> um, but but I but I, I I do think both through sort of the, the sort of protest movements that have come up against this sort of policies the past year, um, and also through your questions and comments that that sort of pushes us to think 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 more inclusively and, and broader about um, about um, urban policies and and who who policymakers are accountable to and who we as academics are, are accountable to. So I think I'll end there. Yeah, thank you very much.